Hi everyone, my name is Charlie and today I have my November wrap up. Please ignore this area behind me. I think that my father is stockpiling mints. It's a complete mess. I don't know why. Some of the books that I will be talking about today I don't have because I've given them away already and because I don't follow rules I'm currently recording this in the middle of December. Firstly, I'll begin talking about the books that I started in October, continued to read throughout November, and will be finishing in December. That first book being The Haunting Season, Ghostly Tales for Long Winter Nights, which includes ghost stories by popular gothic writers writing today. I'm really enjoying this. There are writers in here that I have previously read that I didn't necessarily like before when I read their work, and this time around, I'm getting a completely different take on it. Uh, when I read The Eel Singers by Natasha Pulley, which focuses on a relationship from her um, series, which includes The Watchmaker of Filigree Street, I went out and borrowed that book from the library the next day because I've decided that I want to go and read the work, even though I DNF'd it years ago. Jess Kidd, we know I'm a fan of Jess Kidd. Her story in here, sublime. And Laura Purcell, who I read her first book, uh, The Silent Companions, and found that incredibly chilling and just knew that she could write horror well but when it came to the course I felt like it was the same over again. The Chillingham Chair is perfectly dark. I only have three stories left um, because I'll, I still haven't decided whether I'm going to read the Elizabeth McNeil story on Christmas Day because that is a Sunday and I have been reading one of these every Sunday evening but it's just been so brilliant to sit down with one of these gothic, I, I keep calling them gothic, I shouldn't really call them gothic because they are just ghostly tales, these ghostly <laughs> ghost stories. It's been so grand to read one of these every single Sunday. I am thoroughly enjoying the experience and I think I'll be keeping this book and trying to make it one book that I go back to every year or every other year. Another book that I started in November and will hopefully finish soon because I do want to read the final book in the series in December is The Small House at Ellington by Anthony Trollope. This is the... We have had The Warden, Barchester Towers, Dr Thorne and Family Parsonage. So this is the fifth book. This is perhaps so far, the reason it's taken me longer than the previous books is because the prose feels somewhat di different. It feels a bit more dense um, and Trollope seems to have got something that he wants to say and it takes some focus that I haven't necessarily had recently due to other obligations. But as with most Trollopes, I am enjoying this and it reminds me more of the way we live now when it comes to terms of tone. I have to say that I don't yet feel an attachment to any characters despite being 220 pages in, but I do have a strong disdain for a certain character which I think is good enough. And yes, he's a man and yes, he's an asshole. A book that I carried over from October into November was Great Expectations and I was listening to the audiobook of this and I finished this audiobook and... Oh, it's just brilliant. Listening to the audiobook just changed my experience entirely of this text, and I wholeheartedly adored it even more than the first time. Martin Jarvis, who narrated the audiobook, did a stellar job, brought the characters to life. It, I felt the warmth and the humour of this book throughout my listening experience. Um, it was like listening to my favourite radio plays and is one that I look forward to going back to because he just brought this story to life. We know the story of Great Expectations. I think that Pip is one of Dickens' better child narrators. I have yet to read Oliver Twist. I like Pip and I like his character. If you're going to take David Copperfield and Pip and Oliver Twist, David Copperfield and Pip, Pip would be miles above Oliver Twist, which reminds me that I do want to read Oliver Twist this month. <laughs> I keep putting it off because I'm just not looking forward to that book, but there's only three weeks left of the year, so I don't have much time. Now let's get into the books that I read. I have recorded a vlog discussing my thoughts on The Historian by Elizabeth Costover and Dracula the Undead by 
Dat Clay Stoker and Ian Holt. The Historian, uh, these are two books that I have now donated to the charity shop, which, if you know me at all, means that I did not care for them in the end. In terms of The Historian, I very much liked the first few hundred pages of this, but the... And it, and it moved incredibly quickly. But for me, the issue that I had... I didn't hate the book, is why I should start with The Historian. I thought that it was a good book. It's not a book that I want to reread unless I wanted to read a travel log about Europe. There is something that I liked about this book was the impending threat that Dracula always posed throughout this book. It was the lack of his presence that I particularly liked, the way that we turned him into a legend, and when we consider the time in which this book came out, in which we were seeing a lot of these rewritten mythologies such as with the Da Vinci Code and those books by Dan Brown, Labyrinth by Kate Moss, you've got a tendency towards a more literary thriller. I have to say it has made me want to go back and try to read Labyrinth by Kate Moss again because I didn't give it much time when I was the 13 and this book first came out but having read the historian I think I could dedicate the time to reading that book so that's something that's good about it. <laughs> the poor thing for me was the fact that the character's narration never changes, but we supposedly have at least five different narrators throughout the entire writing of this. But the voice that the author kept up was of pretentious American writer. Um, at one point, she says that I could tell the ca this person was from the north of England based on his voice great, but the way in which this character spoke was nothing like the way in which a person from the north of England would speak, and it felt as though she'd never been to the north of England, so she didn't realise that we actually all don't have just one voice, and we don't all speak like we're from Cambridge and have a flaming parsnip up our nose. There was one part towards the end that just got me where this Englishman, this man, said something along the lines of, I just thought you were in the bathroom, girls are always in the bathroom. And the time in which this is written, like, we'd have called it a lavatory, a water closet, a toilet. Bathroom tends to be the room in which there's a bath, at least in the north of England. So I don't know. It just felt like Costova hadn't done the research into the different ways in which people speak, their idiolects and their dialects. And that really just stuck with me. And I couldn't get further than that, but you'll see more of that in my vlog if I ever get around to editing it. Dracula, the Undead, I really liked for the first 100 pages, and I couldn't see why people disliked this book so much. And I soon figured out why. They took Mina Harker, who is a character who is already maligned in Dracula. And in Dracula, the Undead, choose... So, at firstly, I think that they were clearly wanting a Hollywood adaptation of this. The time in which this book came out, I think that it was definitely fuelled by all the hype around Twilight, so that they could say, oh look, here's the original story of Bala and Edward with Mina and Dracula. We took Dracula's motivation and changed it entirely to make him into this anti-hero, as though he'd never done anything wrong in his life and he had good motives in the end. And it was dire, it was awful, and I feel incredibly unfortunate to have read this one entirely full of misogyny. I do not like the representation of sapphic relationships within the tale, as though to be a lesbian is almost turning your back on God and the only re- like, as though our villain made a decision to be gay as this big fingers up to God, rather than the fact that it's just who she is as a person. I hated how we villainise that. It really sat wrong with me and I am appalled <laughs> at the existence of this book, is all I can say. <sighs> okay. <laughs> so then I read The Fell by Sarah Moss. And this came about because I was feeling a certain type of way, having only read two books in November at this point, and we were towards the end of November. I was like, I need to get some short books. I need to get some books read because I was feeling incredibly anxious and getting head up because I was like, I haven't read enough. The books that I have read have been shit. I, um, I, I just got into that mood that is sometimes difficult to get out of. So I went to a few short reads. <laughs> 
and this was one of them. This reminded me why I liked Ghost War by the same author, because I read this in one sitting due to detention, and Sarah Moss managed to read tension. In fact, I actually do believe that I mentioned this in a video that never made it online. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to include this portion of vlog footage that never made it to a vlog here and you'll get to hear about a few of the books and then I'll come back to you and talk about the rest. Last night I read The Fell by Sarah Moss and this was because I have read Sarah Moss's fiction before and I know that it can be incredibly tense but propulsive which is what I found with Ghost Wall where I had to read that book in one sitting because the tension was really getting to me but that is also a book that left me sad for a fortnight and kept me steering clear of summer water. I didn't have that same experience with summer water but with the fell. Enjoyed the stream of consciousness style that Sarah Moss has employed within the prose and part of me thinks that it must be such hard work to write something that seems so effortless. At the same time part of me becomes conflicted because it did feel almost like everyone was having this same rambling going on but at the same time it was amping up this tension because we're inside everybody's heads and so we are diverting from thought to thought to thought uh, yet there is some cohesion in it set during the covid lockdowns and because of that there's even more of a tension because you you can almost remember how everyone was staring almost accusatory at their neighbours. It's one that I think I'll keep and maybe leave it a few years and then come back to looking at, looking at it to see how I feel then because we're very close to that period of time. Then I read Letting Go by Angela Topping which is a poetry collection about motherhood and parenthood and grief and I went to university with Angela's daughter and Angela came and was a guest at um, Poems and Pints a few months ago and I purchased this collection then which is poems that have been taken from previous collections and put into this one and published by Mother's Milk. I thought that some of the poems in here were brilliant evocations of grief which did leave me thinking about things that I didn't really want to think about with the state of mind that I currently am in, um, such as the loss of parents and what that does to your position in the world and making connections with lost relatives and how their absence feels and what they missed out on. And it, then we have the poetry as well, which, as I say, I always talk about the way that a poem sounds. And in some of the poems, we had great use of assonance and metaphor. But for the most part, these were very family oriented stories, well, poems that struck a chord. Whilst there was a lot to be said for the poetic form, I felt a lot of emotion from the actual poems themselves. This morning whilst I waited to fail my MOT, I read Bonsai by Alejandro Zambra and this was translated by Megan McDowell and on the back this says it's a piece of innovative metafiction. I really liked it. I, I... <laughs> so we have Julio and Amelia who we meet in the beginning as two students who meet, have sex with one another and then begin something of an entanglement. Then their paths diverge and we only get to see vignettes of the way their lives have gone. I mean, this book is fewer than 80 pages, uh, less than 80 pages. This book has fewer than 80 pages. Anyway, it's more of a... It's more of a look at how people only choose the parts of their lives that they wish to share with others. So you, we can never know what fully encompasses an entire human being, but also uh, that a person is very much a creation of 
their surroundings and their experiences and their history. We also go into writing and discuss how writing is almost like bonsai because um, the writer is choosing the path and the direction that they want the story to go in and then we look at love like that as well because when we are trying to get another person to enter into a relationship with us then we only share certain parts of ourselves to make ourselves seem more appealing. And we're back and I realised that um, I didn't actually finish what I was saying about bonsai but I think that I said enough there. So I went on to read An African Allergy by Ben Okri. This is a collection of poems that was released after he won the Booker Prize in the early 1990s and was work that had been released over a period of 10 years. Unfortunately, I didn't care for it that much. It wasn't the type of poetry that I enjoy. I appreciated the images that Ben Okri was creating, but when for me, when it comes to poetry, I like to be able to think about how it's going to sound and see if there was a rhythm. And this felt like a lot of images thrust onto the page and some story there as well and some very difficult topics that the poet was going into and reading it in 2022 which is nearly 30 years after the events and recognizing that a lot of things haven't changed as some of these events were actually taking place 40 years ago and things still haven't changed that was shocking to me and that was difficult to get my head around but the poems themselves I did not really care for the craft of them uh, so it's one of those things where I appreciate the content, but not the craft. Then I read King Kong Theory by Virginie Despentes, which she said that she was writing for the ugly and the unfuckable, and I was like, here we go. Darkly acerbic, polemic, feminist text that I'm not sure there are parts I agree with, but I also don't know whether it's my place to disagree or disagree with the author's comments, because... I was also able to understand where the author was coming from and recognise that this is simply her view on these topics and she is neither saying that everyone has to ascribe to her ideals nor do they have to take everything she says as gospel. This is just her way of navigating the world. And I could deal with that. I also, you know, I recognise the hypocrisy in the world through her texts and um, she does a good job of blending life experiences with her beliefs to emphasise how she actually came by those beliefs. So all in all, uh, uh, apart from that, I thought that it was a very, I thought that it was strong in terms of the writing. So whilst I might not have agreed or disagreed with the author, I understood where they were coming from. Then we had Happy Stories Mostly, already donated it to the charity shop because it was a one and done type book for me. These stories are all interconnected, somehow deal with a lot of um, gay relationships or these gay relationships do like get discussed a fair bit within the book and like I say they're all connected to one another and the relationships and names are reused and what have you and are they the same person? Are they not the same person? I guess you'll just have to figure it out. Um, the poem, no, not poems, they're short stories that were made to be re read and reread. Uh, but unfortunately, at, once I'd finished the book, I felt no drive to ever want to reread them. Um, like I say, it was a one and done type book for me. I didn't necessarily care for the short stories. I don't know what it was about the book that I didn't like, but I just didn't like it. And I think that that's fair to say. And then the final book that I read in November was Mensana in Thingamy Doodah, which is a collection of half-hour television players that Victoria Wood had on in the, was this the late 80s or the early 90s? Yes, in the late 80s. And I have all of these on a DVD and I've yet to watch all of them, although I have seen two. I have seen the title um, play and I believe, was it out of this collection? I have seen Valderie and I believe we would quite like to apologise. So I've got a fair few that I haven't seen yet, but I have now read the scripts for them. And 
whenever I read a Victoria Wood script, I'm able to tell how it would have been performed. We know that Victoria Wood is my favourite writer, let's just put it that way, because I watch Dinner Ladies countless times throughout the year. I know it inside and out. Every time I watch it or re-watch it, I'm always finding new things. Even though you think that there would be nothing new, I'm there theorising to myself about how characters were related to each other, how things would have gone on. At some points, I even consider if you ever chose to do a reunion, you know, because not like a proper reunion, reunion thing. Oh, look at that, I was properly sprawled then. <laughs> but just like when people meet up with who they used to work with, and so whether they could have just met up in Manchester, filmed it at the Waldorf Hotel or something, and had them meeting up after 30 years if Victoria Wood hadn't died. I think it was six years ago now. It might have been because for quite a while after her death I couldn't bring myself to watch anything that she was in because I was incredibly sad about it. But whenever I read her I'm able to tell how it would be performed and it's something that I've always appreciated about the way that she writes and the way that Alan Bennett writes which is you can tell through the way that they punctuate their sentences that they have a very clear idea as to the way a piece should sound and it's something that surprises me when I hear from other writers because it seems to be the way that my head works that when I'm writing I can hear the words in my head and Mattson Taylor's talked about it as well when he was talking about writing all about Evie and sometimes you'll write and you'll know that there's a three syllable word that needs to go in a certain place but you can't figure out what that three syllable word is yet and so our Doris got changed many times and I'll even change stuff when I'm reading it now <laughs> because I'll be like oh no this would work better here and I shouldn't really but as Delta Goodrum once said when it came to performing her songs of course she changes them when she's on stage they're her songs she can do and so of course I change my monologues when I'm performing them because they're my monologues I can do. Um, also sometimes the references need changing a bit um, Apart from the past ones, we all love Diana Dawes around here, um, but there's always bits of information that I wish I'd had, um, I wish I'd known about before and included in there. And sometimes you think, no, I'll just, I'll save them for another book. But yes, it was a, it was a great way to round off the month, especially since I'd been having a bit of an awful time. So I just I needed to go to something that I could rely on. I also have um, up to you, Porky, which I got to perform a piece from that for GCSE and I always go on about that. Either way, that's me. Them's the books. If you've read any of them and would like to discuss them then please feel free to do so in the comments. Whether you like them or dislike them we can chat. That video about the historian and Dracula the Undead might be up sometime but you know I recorded a vlog for Marple when I read that and that's still not out yet so don't count on it anytime soon. I hope that you have enjoyed this video because until next time, that is all.